It is uh, good to be here continuing our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I think we all know that there is a difference between uh, knowing something intellectually and then understanding something. Uh, The knowledge about something versus the understanding or the experience of something. I think one person who demonstrates this uh, is C.S. Lewis. If you don't know by now, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite, if not my favorite author. I, I think... Uh, his brilliance, uh, his, his ability to process information, uh, is, he has few equals. He's written some of the most thought-provoking books and dealt with some of the most challenging subjects. Yet I believe his most powerful work is his 1960 book, uh, A Grief Observed. Lewis has written, he, he wrote books on pain and suffering. Uh, he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain, and yet I think this small, barely 80-page book tops the list of his most powerful works. And the reason I believe it is so moving is while Lewis has written about suffering before, about pain, this is his first-hand account of it. It is a collection of his journals that were published uh, after the death of his wife. It it looks at uh, questions of despair and depression and heartache as he struggles with all of the things he knows about the Christian faith and then is experiencing now, it's, it's got mixed emotions, questions for God, struggles with uh, others. And in fact, many who read this, it is so deep and so thought-provoking and so challenging uh, that many Christians at the time thought Christians shouldn't be allowed to ask these kinds of questions uh, because it can get so uncomfortable at times as he just deals with the depth of his despair. And ultimately, I I believe this book has so much power because in every book he has ever written and teaching he's ever given uh, is now being worked out in the reality of his life. He says this at one point, We were promised sufferings. They were a part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn. And I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself, not to others. And in reality, not in imagination. This morning we come to a text of scripture that we may be tempted to turn into some sort of academic exercise. It is easier to deal with pain and trials when we're thinking about others' pain and trials. It is easier to imagine suffering and how to respond to it from the outside than to deal with it ourselves. But Jesus tells us this morning that we are only blessed as we face the depravity and wickedness found in this world. Blessed are those who mourn. That we must not just be those who know about the wickedness and the trials in this world. We must be those who understand. And so we don't come this morning to a text of Scripture as scholars trying to parse a text. But we come with our eyes open to the reality of pain and suffering in this world, attempting to understand how we can be mourners, as Jesus calls us, that we would be blessed. And as a reminder, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is promising us something extraordinary, a flourishing life. Remember, the word blessed is better understood as the word flourishing. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God. And Jesus explains in the sermon what kind of people are those who are flourishing in the kingdom of heaven. Who makes it big in the kingdom? Who fulfills their potential by becoming what they were created for? Who is the ones that are bearing fruit for God with those whom God is pleased? Who will flourish? And he's giving the sermon in direct contradiction to the Pharisees who looked like the picture of what a flourishing life would look like. Man, they've got it put together. They wear the best robes. They look the best. They are the most organized. They are the most disciplined. Man, they always look like they have it figured out. And Jesus in the Beatitude completely reverses who it would look like is truly flourishing in God's kingdom. No, who is flourishing in God's kingdom is not the high, not the mighty, not the Pharisees. But as we looked at last week, it is the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. And in these first nine statements, we see what are called the Beatitudes. Jesus saying, blessed are, and in each one, he is reversing, in in a paradoxical fashion, who we would expect to be God's, God's number one people. 
not who we would expect. It is not the most natural who are powerful in spirit. It is not those who have it put together. And in fact, it is those who, as we looked at last week, are reliant on God, have nothing to bring to God, not those who bring things. And this week we see another reversal. It isn't the bubbly, the joyful, the full of life, the loose, who flourish in God's kingdom. It's those who are mourning. Yet we want to make sure that we rightly understand who these mourners are, or we might be tempted to misapply what Jesus means here in a direction he doesn't attend. So if we want to flourish in the kingdom of heaven, we can't just simply attach the word mourn to anything we want. We have to understand what Jesus means by it in context. And therefore, what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to show you three qualities of a mourner who will flourish in the kingdom of heaven. So three qualities of a mourner who will flourish in the kingdom of heaven. But before we do that, let's pray one more time. Father, as we come to this text of Scripture this morning and we seek to understand what it means to be a mourner, those who wail and weep and lament sin and its effects in the world, that you would help us to be those who rightly understand. Father, be with us. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first quality, the first quality of a mourner who flourishes is that mourners who flourish are first and foremost poor in spirit. Let me read again verses 1 through 2. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I, I think that there's a tendency in our reading of the Sermon on the Mount, and especially the Beatitudes, and especially with how slow I preach, to take these, sep- these statements as separate from one another. We may take them as even sort of a checklist. We go through them and see which of the Beatitudes we've got and which we don't. Well, I'm doing pretty well at poor in spirit this week. Mourning, not going so well. Meekness could use a little work, but I am hungry and thirsty, so I'm doing that one just fine. Right? It's like, but you can't read the statements like that. They are a package deal. You are this kind of person, or you are not this kind of person. You can't be like, well, I'm poor in spirit, but I'm not really hungry and thirsting after righteousness. So, you know, I've got that one down, so I'm good. It doesn't work like that. They all come together. You got them all, or you got none of them. And it isn't an accident that the Beatitudes begin with poor in spirit. Remember, poor in spirit, totally reliant upon God. It is to cry out to God for mercy, knowing that you can't save yourself. It is to be the opposite of a Pharisee. It is to bring nothing before the king and say, man, you should let me in. I mean, if you think of the old adage, when you die and you stand before the Lord, he says, why should I let you into heaven? If you say, well, I, and that's how you start, you're not getting in. Anyone who begins thinking they have something to offer God are not poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven does not belong to them. The only thing you will be able to say before him is because you are merciful. That's it. And if you believe that you have within yourself what you need to please God, if you think that by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that you are good with God, then you cannot be the kind of mourner that Jesus is talking about. We, and because when we use the word mourning, we think that anyone could be a mourner. I mean, we attach this word so broadly, but not everyone can be the kind of mourner that our text talks about. And this gives us helpful qualifications, what it can't mean. Because the type of mourner here is not simply being sad about anything that's happened bad in your life. It's not just being sad about things that have happened in your life. For instance, I think of the story of the rich man who goes to talk to Jesus about what it would take for him to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells him, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and then you have the kingdom of heaven. And he says, but the man leaves sorrowful because he had great wealth and he didn't want to give it away. Believe me, he's really sad, but he's not mourning. He's not mourning because to mourn, he would have to realize he has nothing to bring. And there's a lot in our world that we can be sad about. There's a lot that we can be sad about. We can be sad because of our hard lives. We can be sad because bad things are happening. We can be sad that people are dying. 
We can be sad that our lives aren't the way or aren't looking the way we envisioned when we were younger, that we're not going on the trajectory, that that girl doesn't like us. We can be sad about a lot of things in our world, but that is not mourning. Mourning is first and foremost being poor in spirit. You have to be poor in spirit first. It is the basis, and that means... To be a true mourner is to realize that you have to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. The only ones who are mourning who will flourish in God's kingdom are Christians. Paul will say godly sorrow leads to repentance. The idea is this, that there is a kind of sorrow that is not godly. There is is a kind of self-reflection and sadness that is not godly. And we know it's not the morning he's talking about because it doesn't lead to any kind of repentance. It doesn't lead to any kind of crying out for help. And so, if you want to be the kind of mourner who is flourishing, first and foremost, be sure you are poor in spirit. That you are crying out to God for help. Secondly, mourners who flourish are those who grieve brokenness caused by sin. Now, a little bit of context will be helpful here. Grieve brokenness caused by sin. So here's some context. The, the poor in the spirit and uh, blessed are those who mourn are actually allusions from, uh, from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. He's going to quote this, actually he's going to quote this text of scripture in Matthew chapter 11 when Jesus is talking about what his ministry is and what it is. And so here we know he's alluding to these verses as well. Isaiah 61, 1 through 2 says this, the spirit of the Lord uh, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and, to, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So the prophecy in Isaiah is specifically about the people of Israel going through a very difficult situation because they have been disobeying God. In their disobedience, God sends Isaiah the prophet to come and say, Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, because the north has already been kind of wiped out by exile. And then he says, hey, if you guys don't figure it out, you're next. I'm about to send another nation to conquer you and send you into the exile, and you're going to be in captivity and in prison. And so the prophecy, the context of Isaiah is this, is that it is a mourning of destruction that is brought about because of sin. So sin brings us destruction. Sin brings curses. It brings pain and trials. And I think that this helps us discern the kind of mourning Jesus is talking about. Above I said it's not just sadness, and that's true. But we also must see that mourning of, that Jesus is talking about isn't just a mental state of depression. It's not just a disposition of sadness. Jesus isn't telling us to be gloomy people. Blessed are those who are obnoxious to be around. Like, that's not what this is saying, right? Blessed are those that, like, don't invite them to the party. Like, that's not what Jesus is saying here. This isn't the glass half empty people. It is a mourning attached to something specific, it is, is a kind of mourning that is reactionary. There are many words used for the word mourning and sorrow in Scripture, but this word is when someone sees some wickedness taking place, when they see righteousness not happening, when they see justice not happening, and they can't help but have a reaction to that. It is the word used when grief is too deep for concealment. A pain from seeing everything is broken. It's the type of mourning attached to seeing the experiences and effects of something happening. And as Christians, we know that all brokenness in the world is from sin. All of it. Thus, when Jesus is telling us to mourn, he is telling us, feel the brokenness of the world. When we see wars, pain, suffering, injustice, or disaster... To mourn is to cry out, God, fix what is broken. 
So please don't leave here this morning thinking that Jesus wants you to just be a miserable person. That's not at all it. He wants you to mourn over the brokenness that sin causes, that we should be grieved by what causes sin. And as I was reflecting on this, I realized that I think there are three primary categories in which we should be, as Christians, we should be grieving over brokenness of sin. Jesus wants you to mourn. He, I, I think he wants you to mourn over your personal brokenness because of sin. Your personal sin has caused you to mistreat others, to be proud and arrogant, and to lead you to do things that you are absolutely ashamed of. The deep recesses of things that you are just ashamed to bring up and don't want to talk about. But not only that, I, I think that also your personal brokenness in regards to your physical body. I mean, we live in a culture where eating disorders, dissatisfaction with how you look, sexual inclinations and acts, sickness, all of those things, not even to mention the decay that just comes with getting older. We are broken individually. We are broken because of sin. And Jesus says that when we see that, we are to mourn. But he doesn't just want you to mourn over your individual brokenness. He wants you to mourn over communal brokenness because of sin. Can you, do you see how sin has ravaged communities and relationships? There are people in your life who I'm convinced you could think of right now who you don't speak to and won't speak to you. There are communities and races at odds with one another. There are political parties at each other's throats. There are places of great injustice and oppression. There is sex slavery, individual slavery, and people group slavery all over the world. And in the world, and even in our own backyards, children are beaten and killed. Women are used and mis discarded. Murders continue. The sick are forgotten. The weak are left helpless. Wars happen worldwide without any indication that they will ever end. Our communities are broken. Like our world is broken because of sin. Mourn. Not only that, he also wants you to mourn over creational brokenness because of sin. Look at how sin has ravaged this planet. Nature is at war against us. Tornadoes kill thousands, hurricanes threaten more, fires, droughts, floodings. Storms make havoc on millions upon millions. We live on a planet that fights our very existence. Creation is broken because of sin. Mourn. This is exactly what we see happen in the book of Genesis, right? So in the book of Genesis, when mankind sins against God and they go against God, what happens? They are punished. He said, if you eat this, you will die. And what happens? Their bodies start dying and decaying. Their sin leads to personal and individual suffering and death. But not only that, does not it lead to communal suffering and death? Immediately, the husband and wife are ashamed to be seen by one another. And they hide. And then what happens in chapter 4 of Genesis chapter 4? Cain kills Abel. It doesn't take long for sin to manifest itself brokenness in community. But not only that, is not creation itself also broken? When mankind sins, what happens? Cursed is the ground because of you. It will produce only thorns and thistles, and you will have to work tirelessly for it. Listen, I, I know, I, I, I've made it my kind of... Uh, my soapbox to talk as much as I possibly can about joy and happiness because I think the Bible does a lot. In fact, right, the church's kind of mission statement is joyful gospel advancement. Be joyful. But I find it fascinating. And when I first read this, I was really shocked by it. I didn't like it. I tried to prove it wrong. Um, but I find it fascinating that you will never see in any account ever Jesus be happy or laughing. Not once. Now that, didn't mean, that doesn't mean he didn't. I'm sure he did. But we are never told explicitly that he was happy or laughed. We are told that he was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We are told that he got angry. We are told that Jerusalem grieved him. We are told that he wept. We are told that he was filled with so much pain of what was going to happen that he sweat like drops of blood. We're told a lot of things about Jesus. 
but we are not told about his bubbly attitude. Because when Jesus came, he was directly involved with the wickedness and sin in the world. He came to address that head on. He came to mourn. And let me be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying also on the other side that we should have flippant emotional tirades. Okay, that's not what Jesus had. Listen, this is not telling us to be moody teenagers. We've got plenty of those. All right? What we're seeing here is Jesus is grieved by the brokenness of sin in the world. And I, I, I fear, I fear that many of us do not do what this text is saying because instead of actually seeing brokenness in the world, we would rather be blinded. Like we would rather not have to look at the brokenness in the world. But if you saw the way Jesus saw, then I'm sure that these descriptions would be said of you as well. Do you grieve over our city? Do you mourn over the lostness in your family? Do you see the wickedness and brokenness in your life and how that is affecting others? And are you grieved? Do you mourn? over sin in this world, mourners who flourish in God's kingdom are deeply cut by the brokenness caused by sin. And only as are we these kind of people, then will we understand the last quality of mourners who flourish in God's kingdom. Third, mourners who flourish in God's kingdom are filled with hope. Thankfully, our text does not end with mourning, but with comfort. Look at it again. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. And this is giving us hope. And it gives us hope. But I wonder, as I was reading this, I struggled with this idea. Because they shall be comforted. Because I was just trying to process, like, well, I know that the reason Jesus says this is because he's giving hope to mourners. But I was just thinking to myself, like, well, how does this comfort give us hope? Uh, because when I think of the comfort of people, it doesn't usually give me hope. Because when I think of comfort, I think of a kind of gesture where one, per, where one person to another in a terrible situation. And I think of it in human terms. So maybe you think of people spending time with you after a loved one died. They sat with you, maybe they made you meals, they did nice things for you. But the more I thought about that, the more I thought, how comforting is that? Listen, I tell people after the loss of a loved one that the deepest point of grief are not going to happen for a few weeks. Because right after the death of a loved one, there are sharp, immediate pain. There's a lot of shock that happens, and there's a ton of people around. And the emotions are so high, and there's so many people that you're not really processing what's happening. But the deepest, the darkest points of grief is when everyone's left. And then you have to go back to the routines you used to do, and that person's not there anymore. And you turn around, and you're alone. That's when grief settles in. It, it takes up board in your house somewhere. It gets comfortable. It settles into your bones, and it doesn't ever leave. They say time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. And, and it pops up in the most inconvenient ways, and in the most inconvenient times. Grief takes hold of us. It's a deep ache that it, it doesn't go away. I know that after my dad passed, I initially had a lot of shock, but grief hits way harder later on. It's in those moments when you have a question, of, when I had a question about yard work, and I couldn't call him to ask. It's, it's when I would walk with my kids and think, man, he'd love to see this. It's the first sporting game that we went to that he's not at. Grief over what sin has brought about in our lives, the effect on relationships in this world, goes on and on and on. And honestly, the comfort you receive from others is pretty pathetic in the grand scheme of things. Now, I'm not saying that I don't appreciate it or others don't either. Getting comfort from others is important, right? But, but what does that comfort actually do for me? Nothing. Because as many times as you patted me on the back after my dad died, he's still dead. 
All the brokenness is still broken. Nothing is any better. And essentially, our idea of comfort is this quiet patting on the back while someone foolishly says, it'll be all right, while you know it will never be all right again. And since that's the human idea of comfort, when we say we, they shall be comforted, God's comfort doesn't sound that enticing. It doesn't sound that enticing because I don't want any more pats on the back. I want the brokenness to be fixed. And so I think we have to understand what this means and praise God that that is not what Jesus means here. What Jesus means when he says they shall be comforted, what he means is everything that is broken will be fixed. Flourishing mourners are those with great hope because God is promising us they shall be comforted. What he means is it shall be fixed. That's what it means. This is how scripture typically uses this word when it's attached to God's comfort. So listen with me to Isaiah chapter 40. This is right after a prophecy of Babylon is about to come in and destroy Jerusalem. And this is what he says in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. What is the comfort from Jerusalem? Not, man, I'm so sorry that you're having to go through that. No, it is that warfare is ended. Your sins are forgiven. Pats on the back, words of solace are not comfort. Restoration is comfort. When my sin causes brokenness in my soul, I don't need more platitudes. I need it to be fixed. When sin between people breaks relationships, we don't need more people gossiping and trying to take one side or the other. We need it to be fixed. When sin breaks nations and leads to war and destruction, we don't need more speeches about what side is right. We need a new king. When evil reigns and wicked people do terrible things, taking advantage of the weak and hurting the needy, we don't need another promise that we will devote more resources to this. We need a just judge. When sin breaks the world apart through natural disasters, famine, and disease, we don't need more and better technology to save us. We need a restored and resurrected earth. And when sin gives us our final wages of death, taking all those in life we have ever loved and eventually taking us as well, we don't need more Hallmark cards. We need resurrection. We need comfort, which is ultimately found in God and God alone. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. Again, I'm not saying don't try to comfort one another. The church does that. And Paul is clear, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that we seek to comfort those who are in affliction, just as we have been comforted in affliction. But understand that that comfort that Paul is talking about is a comfort rooted in the fact that God will fix the affliction. He will restore what's happened. He will give Paul his reward. Not this temporary feel-good stuff we find in the world. Because what we should want... And what Jesus is talking about here is that we would stand before the throne of God like those in Revelation 7, and we want this to be true of us. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst, in, uh, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I don't know why you came here this morning or what you are dealing with this morning. But I know this. The gospel of Jesus Christ offers you a comfort you can find nowhere else. If you are mourning over the brokenness in this world, I have wonderful news for you. God will restore everything. He will fix all of the personal brokenness. All of your internal sins, he will completely wipe clean in the resurrection, and he will give you a new body. 
in the resurrection, he will, he will fix everything that was ever wrong, every communal brokenness in this world, every nation at war, every relationship broken. He will restore all things. And in creation, he will restore this earth to a resurrected earth. God will give those who mourn the comfort they've been searching for. And this leads to hope. True mourners who flourish are those who have hope. And so, church, the question is this. How do you mourn? Are you mourning in such a way that you flourish in the kingdom of heaven? Are you the kind of person flourishing? Now, at this point, you might ask, so, because I've been saying that it's not just a future thing, that flourishing now are those who mourn. Flourishing now are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But the promise of comfort is in the future. So how am I going to flourish now in God's kingdom? Because Jesus is giving us the Sermon on the Mount to say, these are the kind of people who will flourish now in God's kingdom, who will be all they want to be, <coughs> can be in God's kingdom. I see, maybe you're with me, you're like, man, I'm looking forward to resurrection. I, I'm looking forward to that. But I don't know about you, I haven't seen any dead people raised. Sin and his pain and sorrow still seems to reign supreme. But I believe a mourner like this flourishes on earth right near, right here, right now, because the one who's mourning like this does not fall into either side of the ditch I think we are prone to. I was asked, what's the opposite of mourning? What do you think the opposite of mourning is? And I don't think there's a direct opposite. In fact, I think there are two ditches instead. Both maybe would be considered opposite. On one side of the ditch, I, there are people who ignore pain and suffering in the world. They ignore it. They don't want to deal with sin or its effects. Maybe we would call this group the, ex, uh, the escape artists. Like they're, they're, they want to escape. We distract ourselves. There are the people, and I think a lot of our culture is built on this. Distract ourselves with as much entertainment as possible. Numb ourselves to the sin in the world so we don't have to deal with it. Are you uncomfortable with something that's happening? Pop in your headphones so you don't have to deal with it. I mean, listen. Who likes family reunions? Anybody? I mean, maybe some of you. And if that's you, I bet most of the other people don't that come. <laughs> right? It's like, well, let's just avoid seeing our family. Then we don't have to talk about hard things. Escape it. Man, you don't like what's happening in your life? This pill will help you. Ah, things aren't going well? Just one more drink. I just need an escape. I shouldn't feel this way. I, people aren't meant to mourn. If I'm feeling this way, there must be something wrong with me. We read it earlier, but listen to this. Listen to what Scripture says. Hear the words of James 4. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Listen. Those who are mourning over brokenness and sin in the world are not the people who have the problem. The people who have the problem are those who are acting like there's nothing wrong. If you look around in reality today, if you look at the state of your life and you do not mourn, you're the problem. You're the problem. Because Scripture tells us when you see wretchedness and brokenness, your reaction should be to mourn. That's not called depression. That's called being a Christian. That's called seeing reality as it really is. Man, life looks miserable. I shouldn't feel like this. Well, life is miserable. Yes, you should feel like this. It is broken and wretched. Stop trying to escape the realities of life. Stop trying to live in a world that none of this pain and suffering exists. You can run away all you want, but one day you will face it acutely as you lay ready to die. You can only escape for so long. Be wretched and mourn. But on the other, so that's one side of the ditch, but let's be clear, the other side of the ditch is just as damaging. Many people live in just constant fear and anxiety. 
I mean, it's like everything, every single thing leads to this state of, what am I going to do? Everything's falling apart. There's no hope. The hell in the handbasket, right? Everything stinks. There's no joy in life at all. And you don't try to just ignore pain. You let pain consume you. You are so broken that you're paralyzed. You can't get out of the past. You have to bring up the same things that happened in your life again and again and again. You can't get over the hump. You can't move on with your life. And if that's you, where it's just like, it's not this morning that's being talked about, because these kind of people are comforted. You're the kind of person who just refuses to be comforted. You refuse to see the goodness of God and move on. You refuse to see that he is king over all. And you let all of the news distract you from the, from the reality of what God has done for you in Christ. And if that's you, you might need to hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Church, if we want to be the kind of mourners that our text is talking about, we can neither be blind or crushed. And I believe that mourners who live like Jesus is talking about, neither being blinded to what's happening in their life, nor crushed because they are comforted, are those who are able to flourish right now. We can see reality as it really is, but not have fear of our reality because we have a God who is in control. This gives us a supernatural strength that most in the world don't have. And we flourish now because we have a strength that comes from God, a strength that sees wickedness and pain and death and can move forward, a strength to be faithful. And listen, the, the, the ordering of the Beatitudes is so beautiful. You're poor in spirit, you rely on God, you mourn, but you're not the kind of people who are crushed down. And so because you're not crushed down, because you're not blinded, you see what's really happening, but you're not crushed by it, what can you do? You can be meek. You can hunger and thirst for righteousness. You can be merciful to others. You can seek peace and pursue it. And when you're reviled, you don't have to revile back because you have a king in control. This is supernatural strength. And when I think of an example of this kind of strength, <clears throat> I, I think of a story and a great hymn that I think many of you have heard the story behind before. It's the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. The author of It Is Well With My Soul, his name is Horatio Spafford. He was a lay leader and the Presbyterian Church, who went through deep mourning. In 1861, two tragedies struck. First, his four-year-old son died of pneumonia, and then the Great Chicago Fire happened. And Horatio was a prominent investor in real estate at the time, and so this fire nearly bankrupted him and his family. And so between the years 1861 and 1863, he worked diligently to build his life back together, but his family were struggling and all this has happened. There was so much anxiety going on in his life at this time that uh, some leaders and some friends that he had uh, told him it would be good for him to get away from a while. So Spafford decided it would be good for him and his family to get away with some friends and take a trip to Europe. And so they planned this trip to Europe as a family, and they were set to set sail on November 21st, 1873. Right before the trip, Horatio got some really bad news and, uh, about his business ventures. And so he was going to have to cancel or postpone the trip because he had to be there for a business trip. But uh, they talked about it, and they decided that him, his wife, Anna, and their four daughters, Annie, 12, Mar <clears throat> Margaret Lee, 7, Bessie, 4, and Tanetta, 18 months, would board the ship without him, and then he would get on the following ship. 
On the first day of the trip, in the middle of the Atlantic, tragedy struck as their boat collided with another, in which all four children drowned. I won't go into details on their death, but if you've read it, it is filled with great pain about how the family fought to stay alive. The saddest of which is when a wave, or as you'll hear in a little bit, a sea billow, ripped baby Tanetta out of her mother's arms. Only his wife Anna survived. She was picked up by another ship and landed in Wales after nine days at sea. And from there, she sent a cable to her husband. The first line read, saved alone. What shall I do? Upon, <clears throat> upon receiving the cable, Horatio boarded the next ship and set sail. While sailing, the captain called him into his cabin to tell him that they were passing over the very spot where the boat sunk. Horatio goes back into his cabin, and while passing over the watery graves of his children penned these famous words, When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. This is what it looks like to flourish in the kingdom of heaven. This is not a man who's pretending not to mourn. And this is not a man who is lost in despair. This is supernatural strength who sees the reality of brokenness in this world, but sees the grace and mercy of his great king, knowing he shall be comforted. He is one who flourishes. Do you want to flourish in God's kingdom? Do you want the strength to be faithful with what's before you? Do you want to prosper, be fruitful, grow into greatness in his kingdom? Well, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which saves us. We thank you that you bless those who mourn. Father, teach us and give us a spirit of mourning. Father, you are good and merciful to us. 